uh, they just canceled the Caneland meet today. So we were going to run a couple of horses there, but now it's everything's crazy. We just don't know where to, I'm not sure that they know even where they're going to send the horses now because they're canceling all the meets now. It's, uh, you know, living right now. Uh, I'm sure you were out of the country recently, right? Did you just come back in the country? I just got back two days ago. Uh, Living in this first from where you were, uh, and of course we're talking with Rick Patino, folks, who just took over as the, or will take over as the coach at Iona. You were coaching in Greece. How was, how was Greece compared to what we're going through here? Well, it was just starting to develop into closing. The prime minister was doing an outstanding job. There was about 40 cases. Then it went to 80. Then they shut down all the bars, all the restaurants, all the public places, just as I was leaving. Yeah, so, so they were probably about they were probably about a week ahead of us. Gotcha. So I mean, we're seeing as as the world goes through this day by day, and we're watching as you know we've never lived through any. I mean, I can can you imagine you know uh, as you prepared for March your whole life? Can you imagine an NCAA tournament not being played? I mean, can you imagine a Masters not being played or the Kentucky Derby not being contested? It's hard to fathom what's going on right now. It really is. It is, and it's it's your heart breaks for those who not only catch the virus, but for those out of work. And we've never experienced anything like this before. And uh, I think we're getting a grip on it now. Um, uh, you know, you have to somehow look at the positives, and maybe it will unite this country because we've been ununited in in so many ways politically. And maybe all the people can lend a helping hand to those in need and just uh, do something to at least stifle the growth of this uh, dreaded virus. And, uh, you know, you don't know what to believe out of China, whether it is somewhat going away or subsiding somewhat. You just don't know what to believe out of there. You know, um, and and aptly put, and again, I think we have a couple of weeks here where it's just going to get worse and uh, we can all do whatever we can do in our neighborhoods to help because that's where we're going to be spending all our time and uh, wait this thing out. But um, we're talking with Rick Pitino, of course, the news this weekend that he was, I got a call on Friday and I saw it. I had been in touch with Timmy a couple of times during the year. He's been very private about his illness. Uh, and he was always a big part of the show because he and my brother, the Cluse brothers and my brother played basketball together, my younger brother, so I'd known them forever. Uh, and he did a great job at Iona, as you know. He did a, ran a great style, did a great job. And then I knew he was stepping down. Then I got a call that you were going to be a candidate. And I said, wow, you know, I hadn't thought of that, but it makes plenty of sense. How did Iona, how did it start? How, what happened? Take, take me through what happened. Well, you, as you know, Tim Cluse did a fabulous job at Iona, not only at Iona, but at St. Mary's Everywhere, yeah, everywhere. He built a dynamite program. uh, I've been in touch with him. He he obviously did a phenomenal job here. And, you know, he's had a difficult life with his brothers. Sure has. Now his sister and now himself. And uh, our prayers are with him. Absolutely. Great guy. Here's what what happened with me. You know, I didn't ever expect him to return to college basketball. And then suddenly... After the Southern District in New York, after the uh, people went on trial and uh, one witness after another witness got up on the witness stand and said, I had no knowledge uh, that I was not part of anything. And then suddenly colleges started calling me again. And one in particular, um, I had this president of Transylvania, Division Three school in Lexington, Kentucky, call me up after I was fired from Louisville. He said, Coach, you, you were nice enough to leave me and my, uh, my wife and I tickets to a couple of games. Is there any way I, I can call a college for you? This is when I was let go for Louisville. I'd be glad to do it from president to president. And I said, well, that's so nice of you, but uh, I, I don't believe at this time it's, it's going to work, but I really appreciate that. He was friends with my business partner. I have two business partners, Jamal Mashburn, who you know, and right. a fellow by the name of Rick Avar. Rick Avar played at Transylvania, and they became friends. And then suddenly, when I was speaking to him, I said, you know, Seamus, you don't sound like you're from Kentucky or the South. Where are you from? He started laughing. He said, the Bronx. And I went back to Greece, and then all of a sudden, I got a phone call from Rick Avar that Seamus would like to speak with me. He's now the athletic director at Iona College. How wild is that? So that was the genesis of the whole thing, and and he knew all about me from uh, personally and professionally, knew, knew my wife. His wife sat next to my wife at games, and so he said that unfortunately we're going through a tough time, and uh, that Tim is sick, and um, and he's going through some tough times. This was like the tail end of February, and uh, 
And I said, oh, that makes me so sad. And he said, would you be interested? And I said, well, I said, why don't you get, let's see what happens with Tim. And he said, no, Tim is not going to be able to coach anymore. And so they worked everything out with Tim. He came to me and said, would you take the job? And I got a, I, I went, I got a contract and it was hysterical because it was probably two pages. I was used to like 16 pages. And uh, then I looked at the buyout and I called him back. I said, is this serious? And he said, yes. I said, I said, okay, um, let me think about it. And I thought about it. And I thought it would be an unbelievable way to end your career. Be, going back to New York. Uh, I remember Dick Vitale when I called him telling me that Jim Valvano said the best years of his life were at Iona College. And I know the best two years of my life in coaching out of 30 plus years were Providence College. So I wanted to go to a small Catholic school. It was perfect. Uh, Tim did a phenomenal job and I'm hoping to build on that. And um, let's see where it goes. You know, it's funny. You, you mentioned that. Uh, we're talking with Rick Pitino. Uh, when St. John's opened last year, I thought of it, but it was probably too early. Um, and, you know, there was so much going on. Uh, but I go back to, you mentioned Valvano at Iona. I remember those teams with Rulin and Vickers and those guys uh, and his years there. I knew him when he was there. I knew him before he was there. I knew when he was at Bucknell. So, I mean, I knew him going back that far. And I remember your teams well. You know, people might not. It's a long time ago. But, I mean, you did an incredible job at Providence. Billy Donovan, who obviously has gone on to be this, you know, tremendous coach in his own right. But, you know, the whole thing, taking that Providence team, that unlikely team to the Final Four, you know, you had a great team at Kentucky. It was an all-time team. There's no question. But uh, you probably never did a better job than you ever did at Providence. I mean, Providence was an amazing job with a bunch of kids who were underdogs, who, you know, played really hard, who you got into great shape, who you developed players. You like to develop players. Uh, probably was the, a perfect team for you, and that's probably what you'll use as your, your model, right? Yeah, because, you know, they were dead last place for seven straight years since the inception of the Big East. It was a great group of guys. And I, I got very lucky because the three-point line came into play. Mm -hmm. And the first five Big East games, Mike, the, the opponents that I played against didn't take more than five threes in a game. And I was taking 18 to 22 per game. So I got very lucky. We led the nation in three-point shooting. That was the first year it was, it was utilized. And... Um, and it was great. We, to this day, I'll never forget those two years. And now I get to relive, you know, no facilities in Providence, just a gym, just the ball. And now you go to Iona, same type of feeling. I wanted a small Catholic school um, and to end my career. And it, it, it just happened. And uh, it, it worked out great. And coming back home too. So I mean, you know, I know you, yeah. you know, you you know the area so well. You uh, you own places. You live. You have places to live around here. You got golf courses around here. You got everything right in your backyard. It's it, it is your backyard. So it's like coming home. Yep, yeah, I live in Manhattan. I'm, I'm a member of Wingfoot, ten minutes away. I'm, my son lives in Harrison, ten minutes away. I have probably thirty, forty friends that will buy season tickets, and it is awesome. And it's also has because of what Tim has done. And, and think about this, Mike. Every coach that's coached there, from, from Jimmy Valvano to Timmy Welsh um, to Kevin Willen, to Tim Cruz, every one of them has had great success. And every one of them has loved it. And so uh, it, it's a very exciting for me because I, you know, I went through two and a half years of coaching in another country. I've been blackballed out of the business, rightfully so, by the way, because until that – I, I shouldn't say blackballed. I've been kept out of the business. Because that trial, they took it. They took the time with the trial, and not to the trial. St. John's couldn't take a chance at me. Nobody could take a chance until that trial. And once the trial happened, and everybody, one witness after another, got up from Adidas to the father, and said Rick Pitino knew nothing about it. Was I an open candidate? So um, it took a while, but I was very happy to be in Greece. I learned an awful lot about a different brand of basketball, which will help me going forward. And Coaching pro ball in the EuroLeague was an exciting experience. You can bring a lot of your – will it help you? Will you go find players over there? And, you know, a lot of schools do that, especially smaller mid-majors. If you want to call Iona a mid-major, they're kind of a higher-level mid-major, but a mid-major. You know, you can bring kids in. Uh, will you be at an advantage having been over there where you'll locate some kids who can come over here and help you? Well, there's one reason why Gonzaga has been great throughout the years, and that's because of the foreign talent that they get. 
And certainly, Turkey has three teams in the EuroLeague. Um, I'm going to go into Serbia, go into Turkey, and really, really hit the foreign market hard. We've got to bring in seven players this year, Mike. We only have about four guys coming back. Right. We've got to bring in seven players. You know, the program is not where Tim Clues had it. And we've got to – they are going to pass a rule that allows a, a young man to transfer and play right away. Right, because of this year, you're going to gain a year of eligibility for this year, right? You're allowed to – because yep. of this crazy year, kids are going to get to come back. Uh, because, you know, you think about well, a team – No, no, I'm talking, I'm talking about they don't have to sit out anymore. Oh, no, I know that, yeah, rules. too. But also, yeah. if, if you, I didn't know if you'd had any kids who were seniors who would get a chance to get another year. They're talking about giving kids another year of eligibility, too. Yeah, I think I think the seniors in the program here have to move on. Oh, okay. Uh, you know, they they did a good job, but they need to move on. So you're going to have you need seven new players uh, next year. So you're going to go. You can scour and go find some kids. What was it like day in and day out in the league you were in? How, how would you? What level of basketball was the league you were in that you were coaching in? It's like playing with second round draft choices. Like I had Wesley Johnson from Syracuse, and I. I had Tyrese Rice from Boston College, who was a EuroLeague player of the year. I had Nick Calathis, who was a great player from Florida. Um, I had a young man from Texas, young man from Wake Forest. It would be like Division II draft choices, who are the ages between 27 and 35. And not Division II, uh, um, uh, draft, uh, guys who were drafted in the second round. Second, second round. round draft choices. Okay. Draft choices, who are now 27 and 35, older, wiser, more humble. Great, great brand of basketball. Great brand of basketball. And traveling to Moscow, Berlin, uh, Germany obviously has two teams. Uh, Spain has three teams. Awesome experience in Madrid, Barcelona, the Grand Canarias last year. Moscow, Istanbul, Lithuania, um, Serbia. And the crowds were incredible. Did you coach your typical style or did you make changes in in the way you coached? Totally. Totally different. Like, like I, if I was coaching uh, uh, the next pro team, I, there was no pressing. There was some full court pickup, not much. More half court basketball, more um, motion offenses, just great offenses. Really learned a lot about motion basketball within a framework of 24 seconds. How about the idea of, we're talking about Rick Patino. you know, there's nobody who has been better at developing kids who might be you know, guys who can get better, who might not be stars, who you were always very good at developing kids. I know you worked very hard at that. You used to work them very hard during the days. I know some of the stuff you use, the regimen you use with that stuff. Uh, that's always been a great strength of yours. Uh, that, that's something I'm sure you're going to utilize now going forward with this as you build this program, right? Yeah, but I, never, I had a different formula than, say, Duke or Kentucky. You know, Gorky Zhang was ranked 90th in the country. Um, Terry Rozier was ranked 78th in the country. Donovan Mitchell was ranked 55th in the country. Russ Smith wasn't even ranked. So I went after guys with a chip on their shoulder who thought they were being passed by, who had something to prove. They were very athletic. Montrez Harrell, perfect example. He was ranked 90th in the country. Uh, Guys like that who had athletic ability, were hungry to prove everybody wrong. And I'm going to try to do the same thing at Iona. Get after hungry guys who have something to prove. They're really uh, into player development, really into getting their offenses better. And I, I think if that, that formula has worked throughout my career, and I'm going to certainly try it again at Iona. You know, you've been at the, you spent a lot of time at the top of the profession. You, you know, you're a Hall of Fame coach. You've had an incredible career. You've been at the top the whole time. You know, you, no matter where you went, you know, you've always been at the top of the sport, always recognized at the top of the sport. What, what has been the biggest difference or what changed the most in your life in the last couple of years since, since you left Louisville? Well, I think, you know, obviously I left for Greece, a very bitter person, bitter at my assistant coaches for betraying me, bitter at the school that fired me the way they did. And today, uh, two and a half years later, I've, I forgive my assistant coaches because we, we grew up and in, in, you grew up the same way I did in going to Catholic schools and we were, we were taught to forgive, but being Italian, we never forgive. <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, now two and a half years later, um, I've, I forgive those guys that betrayed my, my principles. I, I totally agree with the university of Louisville firing me that even though I didn't 
I, I know I was totally um, – eight, they interviewed 80 different people, and the 80 people said the same thing. He had no knowledge of anything going on. But I was the leader of the team, leader of the, of, of the business, and I had to take responsibility for people doing wrong. So uh, I left that bitterness in Greece, uh, left it behind me, and I'm looking forward in a, in a very positive way at taking on a great challenge that I own. Would you rather coach – if you had had an opportunity, would you have rather coached on the college level or coached on the NBA level if you had had both opportunities? I think I, think I get more out of building a Billy Donovan or developing a Jeff Van Gundy, who was my first graduate assistant at Providence, or developing a Kevin Willard, Mick Cronin, Tubby Smith, Steve Masiello, 30 coaches that have gone on to – uh, I coached Brett Brown in the Sixes. I coached Frank Vogel, was my manager at Kentucky at the Lakers. I coached Rick Carlisle with the Knicks. Um, you know, I, I coached, obviously, Billy. I, I just think I get such a great thrill out of developing coaches, developing guys, players into, and not only the pros, even if they have to go to Europe, but just developing people. Um, th- to me, that's the, the ultimate. And right now at my age, coaching in Iona is a perfect way to go out. Uh, for a coach just developing young men, maybe co- playing in the Euro League, maybe playing in the Euro Cup, uh, maybe getting a few to the NBA, maybe building young men into business people. Uh, I have so many guys out there on Wall Street that I coached that I'm very proud of. A, a, an article yesterday about Jay Twyman, Jack Twyman's son, who uh, had a successful business career, and I was so proud of him. Um, so just, just trying to build young people into being solid citizens, solid people with a work ethic that – is second to none in their lives. What are you still? I mean, I know you still love coaching. I mean, listen. When you left my studio that day, I told everyone you left. When you left, you'll coach again. And I and you said you wouldn't, but I said he'll coach again because you know what? That's what you do. You're a coach. I mean, that's that's a void you can't fill. And you know, John Madden told me a long time ago, years ago, he said. I found something else to do. If you can't find something else to do, you're always going to come back to coach because there's nothing that else fills that void. None of you guys can fill the void. It's what you do. You coach. I mean, I broadcast. You coach. I mean, that's what you do. You do what you do, and that's who you are. You're a coach. I mean, so that's why I always thought you'd come back and coach again because that's that's what you do. That's how you express yourself. Well, think of it, Mike. How many people would who have never coached in the EuroLeague, never been to Greece, would pick up on Christmas – day uh, and take a flight to Greece, not knowing anybody, not knowing the team, not knowing the ownership, not, not many, anything, and just coach. Not many. And so I, I did that and it was a unique experience, but you're right. I, when I, the last time we spoke, I was a bruised and hurt man, uh, bitter and, and, and really dejected over what happened. But uh, today I'm, um, I'm very confident, positive in, in my abilities as a teacher and a coach and and so looking forward uh, to getting back at it again. And, um, it, it, you know, it, you, you have to learn along the way. You learn every step along the way. And my son, I, I've said this over and over, my son gave me the greatest piece of advice after I wrote the book. He said, Dad, get over it. You're not going to convince those who don't want to believe that you're innocent. You're not going to – you just have to understand the people you've coached and the people you mentored as assistant coaches – they're the ones who know the truth. Don't try to convince anybody else He's to right. with your life. He's right. Yep. He's very and, right, because you, you're not going to convince other people. You know what? You can't even bother. You can't worry about everybody else. You just got to live your life. No. That's all you can do. And if they don't want to believe it, they don't want to believe it. That's all. They, you know, you can't well, worry about it. And you know, listen, part of being successful is you're going to get criticized. That's part of the deal. Okay? That's no matter what the walk of life is, that's the way it goes. People are going to be out there, and they're going to always take shots. You just have to understand that, and you just don't let it bother you. Just go forward. That's basically it, you know? So, I mean, no I, I think it's a, I think it's a fun – you know, it's funny. They're used to they're used to an up-tempo style and as you said they're used to winning i mean you know uh, timmy he won every year there i mean you could see the void this year without him i mean they weren't they were they were like fish out of water without him this year because every year he won every year he, no matter who the kids were he won he won 25 games he went to the NCAA tournament he did a great job he did a great job and, and you're one of the few guys who could walk in there and fill his shoes yeah but he did it with class he's i texted with him and you know, he he he, was, he had a fun style. He, he was did. a great teacher. Yep. He was a terrific person. Everybody loved him, and 
it goes back to, you know, all those guys, every single guy that coaches at Iona yep. loves the place. Yeah, it's and true. It's because it, it's an old basketball therapy. school. It's an old time basketball school. As you said, it's a, it, they like basketball and it's a, it's a school with a great, you know, tradition, you know, going back to Richie Guerin and whoever, it's got a great tradition of basketball. It always has. And they've always been very successful. They always have. And it's a, it's a good spot to be in. It's a good league. It's a very competitive league. Uh, and you know, and you and you get to play here too. You get to play in New York, which makes it a lot of fun. Because you know what, in New York, you know everyone gets noticed. All you got to do is win, and everybody gets noticed. And you're going to get noticed anyway. I mean, that's just the way it is. So it's a good place to come home to. It really is. Yep, no doubt. And you're not that far from Saratoga either. <laughs> Although you're yeah, never can, you're never uh, you too know, far from Saratoga anyway. But you know, you know, I haven't lo- I haven't lost any money in a while, so now I get to do that again. <laughs> Uh, you know, listen. Hopefully, that hopefully there is a Saratoga to go to this summer. We can see a couple of our two-year-olds run up there this year because the way things are going, I hope they have a meet by the time we uh, get the summer going. How will that? How will that impact you getting started? I mean, will it, have you thought about that yet? How this will all impact just getting yourself together and getting started on this on this journey here? Well, think about this. I'm going to have to sign seven players without ever any of them visiting campus. Wow. So, and, you know, I did that in Louisville. Have you, have you hired a staff already? Here. Have you got a staff? I've, I've hired two players, uh, two coaches so far, but they have, they're going through the typical um, human resources and, and going through that thing this okay. week. And okay. by, the end, by the end of the next week, I'll have my whole staff complete. Okay. And, um, and so it's, it's going to be difficult to do, but I, I think I can do it. I've had, I've had a lot of people reach out to me saying they're interested. Now I've got to watch film on them and, and go to work on that as well, and make sure you take the right players, the right people. So you got guys calling you up, and, sending your players already. So you, and you have enough yes. guys out there. I mean, you have guys, as you said, you got guys everywhere in America who who you coached, whether they're players or assistants or whatever, and who are head coaches now, who are all over the world. I mean, you have coaches all over the world. So I mean, you got guys everywhere. Yeah, I I, I do think that's a big number to have to fill, but I actually don't think. Uh, we'll have a problem filling it. It just got to make sure we do the right evaluating because, you know, you make one or two mistakes evaluating and it, it really, really hurts you. Will you play the typical Patino style of, 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 of college ball? Will you be the typical Patino team? No question about it. I'm, I, I missed it. It was like my best friend. And um, I, I'm, we're going to get back to playing at up-tempo style. The good thing is the Iona people are used to yeah, they are. basketball yeah, the they same are. way I play. And yeah. Defense would be a little different. They weren't as good defensively as you usually are, but they were really good offensively. They just weren't that good defensively, but they were very good offensively every year. Every year they were. They, yeah, they, they had they very good guards. Well, yeah. great fast breaks. Yep. And, you know, he's a tremendous coach. And uh, so you got a staff. And have you have you zeroed in on your first player without telling us who he is? Have you zeroed in on a player yet, or you haven't signed one yet? I've got about seven players right now that would love to come. Okay. And we're just looking at a lot of film and trying to see, you know, who fits. Because I don't know that there's about three or four players coming back on that team. Right. And I don't, I, I never watched Iona play because they're not on TV. I watched all Big Ten games. Yeah, I never TV saw them games. play. The, you know, they were bad this year, so I never saw them play this year. They weren't, you know, when they, Timmy yeah. wasn't there, they just weren't very good. They won 12 games. They weren't a very good team this year. No, but, it, you know, it. You get it was like when I was at Kentucky. They were a terrible team when I first got there. And I yep. got one player, Jamal Mashburn, yep. and it turned around everything automatically. So if I can get one player like that, um, and then build around that one player, great things can happen right away. And Mashburn's been has become this enormously successful businessman, right? I mean, he's got businesses everywhere, right? You know, I, I don't think I told you this, Mike, but Jamal Mashburn and Rick Avar, the other person, we've been in business together for, for 35 years. Together. All these years, right? And he's been really All successful, hasn't he? Yep. We have a company called MAP, which stands for Mashburn, Avar, and Patino. Right. I'm probably, now they own 75 to 100 Papa John pizzas. They own a waste management company. They own um, three Lexus dealerships, a Toyota dealership. They they own about four other entities. I'm in on a limited basis. Uh, I, I'm basically um, Jamal and Rick. They they want to conquer the world on business, and I, I, I'm a little bit older. And I said, look, take me out of most of that. And 
But I'm in business with them for over 35 years, so it's uh, been exciting. Jamal's a great businessman. He's probably he should be the junior Bridgman, and Jamal Mashburn should be the poster child for for NBA players what they should do in life outside of basketball. That's amazing. It really is. I mean, uh, uh, that that is you know because I I know he's been very successful. You see some of these players. I mean. That's probably, you know, everyone knows the ones who go on to be basketball stars, but the ones that you coach who no one knows about, who go on to have really good lives or become very successful businessmen or doctors or whatever they went on to become, those are the guys that you probably, you probably got a million of those that you keep in touch with that you know, people don't even know about or think about, right? Yeah. They, they own a uniform business as well. And, and interesting enough, Jamal called me one day and said, Coach, we're going to make a move. You're going to be president of, of the Clippers. We're going to uh, we're going to, after the Clippers. I said, no, Jamal, let's not do that. The Clippers aren't worth. They're worth about four or five hundred million dollars. Let's not overpay. No, coach, we're going to go to like seven, eight hundred million. I have a person from China going to help back. I said, Mesh, don't do that. That team is not worth seven, eight hundred million. He called me back the next day and he said, Coach, good news and bad news. I said, please, Jamal, don't tell me we own the Clippers. He said, no, we were like fourth. Choice. It went for two billion. Yeah, Bomber blew everybody out of the water. Yeah. How about that? What <laughs> own and that? Hey, listen, you know, give them credit. That's that's amazing. You know, you hear some of these players with some of the stuff they accomplish. It's unbelievable. It really is. You know, it's a it's a different time. It really is. So, you know, it's funny. You've come out the other side of uh, college basketball, but the game's taken such a hit now, Rick. What would you do to change if you could? From your experiences, what would you change that's reasonable? We all know you can't change everything about the sport. You just got to make some real smart, common sense rules that everyone can live with. What's the thing that has to change for it to get better as far as the whole dealing with? I mean, Beeline gets out because he can't stand what goes on with players and recruiting. And then he goes to the pros. He doesn't like it there either. So he'll probably come back to college. But they got sick of the whole process. All these guys are sick of the process. We all know it. It's a bad process. What can change that's reasonable without it having to be, you know, like it's never going to change where it doesn't exist. We all know that. It's a big time profession it's a big time sport but what can happen that's reasonable that can get the sport back under control well 30 years ago when i first broke in and, and when i was a coach at bu i would say that there was less than eight percent ten percent cheating going on but then it, at that time there was only the five-star basketball camp where all the coaches got together to evaluate players there was no uh, aau basketball then it goes to sonny vaccaro right uh, who ran the camps five star was yep. now in the background then it goes to AAU basketball. Now the shoe companies control the AAU programs. Agents are involved. Uh, now the shoe companies have infiltrated every university and pay them two to three hundred million dollars in the Power Five conferences. So, anytime you have that type of money being involved with each program, about ten percent of, of of those entities could be corrupt at a very high scale. And, and you re, you heard about the fifty thousand, seventy five thousand, hundred thousand. So the best thing that universities can do is share the wealth, cut the rule book in half and say, okay, let the players have their own shoe deals. Oh, they say, no, you can't do that because the colleges have their own deals. Well, get away from that. When it runs out, let, let the players have their own shoe deals. Let them have their own identity. Let them go to the Olympic model and let them, um, let them utilize their names, let them do commercials and, you may say, well, then the rich get richer. Well, that, that, that's, that's, that's the way it is. There's no way around that anyway. There's no, no way. Yeah, you're right. You stop the cheating. You right. stop the cheating. If I'm, if I'm an Alabama football player and I can do a commercial and right. I, can, I can sell my name and sell my rights, I'm not going to be in a rush to get to the pros because I'll be able to give money to my families and help them out in life and let them, let them do the Olympic model. That's the best way to do it because you're going to see this. Um, the G League is going to become, you know, where you can make 150, 200,000, yep. and they'll kill college basketball unless you do something about it. Now, I don't have all the answers, right. certainly, but I think an athlete should have the right to sell his name because any other student has that right. 
When you have something that big and that much money surrounding a sport like you do now in big time college basketball or football, it is very hard to control. There's no way around it. It's just that there's so much money around. There's so much money around these sports now that you know it's going to infiltrate and it's going to make it that much tougher. So anything you can do that makes it transparent is going to help. I agree with you. And the players yeah, have, have, have reached the point where they guys, should get paid. There's no question. You have people caught on wiretap saying, well, we'll give them this much money and give this much money and this much money. Well, if they wouldn't have to stoop to those ugly levels if the players had a right to go out and, and have a shoe contract themselves, sell their name, sell their likeness. That type of underhanded stuff wouldn't go on. It makes sense. It does, I tell you. Uh, but you're not going to have to worry about those guys. They're not going to go to Iona anyway. So, you know, that's it. <laughs> not the start anyway. So, you know, they might leave there that way. But, you know, that's what, but you'll, you'll, you, that's what the idea is. Now you've got to go make, a, find a little point guard and make him into a star. That's what, you look, that's what we'll watch happen. You've got to go find a little guy or find somebody in the backcourt and turn him into a new star in New York. That's what, hey, ba- New York needs some good basketball right now. So, uh, you know, it, it'll be fun to watch. Well, I'm look, I'm so looking forward to it, Mike. I'm, I'm I feel like I'm I'm 27 again. And, good. Uh, I wish I was, but I feel like I am. We all wish we were. So you know, but good. Yeah. You know what? Listen, I'm glad you're back. Good for you. And uh, hopefully, I will see you along the way, and we'll get to see our horses run in Saratoga this summer. So I hope to see you up there, and hopefully, there'll be a Saratoga. So stay well, stay healthy. We'll see you along the way. Okay. Thanks, Mike. Take, Take care, care Rick. Of yourself. Okay, you too. Bye. Rick Patino, back after this.